folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week, which, once again, is a Wes Craven film, which came out 10 years ago on August 19, 2005. And it's not a horror film, it's a suspense thriller called Red Eye. It's a movie about a young hotel manager who shares a plane ride with a young handsome stranger who isn't exactly what he seems. Yep, they're actually taking a plane on a red-eye flight to Miami. It stars Rachel McAdams from The Notebook and Mean Girls. She later went on to do films like Morning Glory, The Bow, and all the rest. Killian Murphy from 28 Days Later, as well as Batman Begins. Brian Cox from Manhunter and X-Men 2, X-Men United. Yep. John Mamaze from Glee, the TV show, along with Paul Blart's Mall Cop and the first two Smurfs movies. Jack Scalia, Kobe Donaldson, Robert Pine from the TV show Chips, Angela Patton, Laura Johnson, Lorraine Lester, Max Kosh, Kyle Gamner, and Brittany Oaks, with special appearances by Wes Craven, Marianne Mantellina, Kyle Ellsworth, the writer, and Chris Bender, the producer. Once again, it's written by Kyle Ellsworth, who's been best known for writing episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Xena Warrior Princess, and is directed by Wes Craven. The movie begins when a young hotel manager at the Lux Atlantic Hotel named Lisa Resert, who's played by Rachel McAdams, who arrives at an airport to take a red-eye flight from Texas to Miami, Florida after attending her grandmother's funeral. While waiting in inside the check-in line, she meets a handsome young stranger named Jackson Ripner, who's played by Killian Murphy, who's boarded on the same plane as hers, but after their flight was delayed due to a bad weather conditions, they meet again at an airport bar and engage in a small talk where they wait, which I know, um, you know, while they were at the chicken line, you know, she was already giving the, that nice lady that he was going to bring on the same plane uh, a Dr. Phil book. Yeah. So anyway, once they went boarding, Lisa discovers that her surprise that Jackson is actually sitting at the same seating that she is actually sitting besides her. So soon after they took off, Jackson actually revealed his dark secret that he is actually, get this, a terrorist operative working for a group who is attempt to assassinate the United States Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security named Charles Keefe, who's played by Jack Scalia, who uh, him and his family are actually staying at the Lux Atlanta Hotel by having an assassination plan that Jackson's coming up with by using a portable missile launcher from the boat in a nearby harbor that's done by the Russian terrorists that they're actually going to fire it at the hotel. So in order for this to work, Jackson must force Lisa to make a phone call from an in-flight phone and order the hotel staff to change Keith's reservation to, to a suite facing the harbor. And if she refuses to cooperate, he will deploy a hitman to kill her father, Joe, who's played by Brian Cox, at his home in Miami, yeah, where he was just staying in watching all these comedy marathons while the home is basically, you know, going for a lot of remodeling and everything. Yeah, that sort of way. Anyway, Lisa finds an attempt to make his way to keep both her father and Keith safe. So then she tries to place a phone call to the hotel that's answered by a co worker, Cynthia, who's played by Jama Mays. But unfortunately, the line goes dead midway through the conversation, yeah, due to, you know, 
a huge storm that's hitting their connections. So of course he tries to fool uh, Jackson into that by changing the rooms. Yeah, Jackson of course catches on and everything. So then she tries to make an alert for all the other passengers to the danger. So at first she tries to attempt to use uh, her Dr. Phil book that she was given to uh, that nice lady during the weight check-in by actually writing some emergencies in the book so in case, you know, you know, they'd be safe for all the other passengers. Yeah, while Jackson is trying to help out a lady, you know, try to put all these bags um, all the way on top. Then, of course, uh, to make matters worse, Jackson actually headbutts uh, Lisa, knocking her unconscious. That's when Jackson's forehead was bleeding. Yeah, all that blood started coming. But then when she finally got up, after the turbulence and everything, she finally, uh, once again, trying to corroborate the their assassination plan, but then she decided to uh, go to the restroom, and that's when she started, uh, you know, sobbing and trying to figure it out what to do. So her attempt was to actually use some soap in the bathroom and and write down 18F has bombed, and that's when Jackson found out and and actually was threatening her to cooperate and you know almost choking her and everything. Yeah, they were fighting inside. I've been telling her not to gamble with his life. So that's not to mention, of course, you know, he even noticed um, the scar that Lisa had um, between her breast. So anyway, so she wants up uh, cooperating with their plans when Lisa Jackson returned to her seats. She makes a phone call, you know, telling the hotel staff to to move them to the suite. You know. She also asked Jackson to call off the man outside of her father's house that has confirmed of the assassination. And just to make sure she, if he didn't do anything suspicious. So once the, the plane lands, Lisa confesses that the knife scar was from a violent rape that she suffered two years ago. But she swore that she'll never let this happen again. But then suddenly she stabs uh, Jackson with get this, a Frankenstein pen that she stole from those two guys that were sitting on board, yeah, the ones that were listening to the headphones and doing all their chats and everything. So then she tries to escape um, and then taking his phone and flee to a plane in the terminal, narrowly escaping both Jackson and the airport security. Um, the little girl, of course, is, who is the passenger who acts to discover them, and so the whole thing and helps Lisa escape by pushing the suitcase into Jackson's way. Yeah, causing him to fall. So then once outside, Lisa steals an SUV. Only to find out that the Nokia phone that she has has a low battery warning. So, so she's trying to make uh, two phone calls to, to let them know. So, and once she did, you know, she calls the hotel first and then everything was complete then she uh, yeah which leads to that and then she then calls her father then the battery dies and she was on her way then when she finally arrived at her house she ran over the hitman just when he was about to shoot her and killed him as well and then checked to see if her father Joe is okay and he was until he was already knocked unconscious by Jackson as he finally appeared already chasing her or all the way around the room trying to find a way to knock them unconscious and everything but then you know they started having a fight uh, Jackson threw her all the way down the stairs then she took um, the hitman's gun and was ready to shoot him which she actually did she shot him but she but then he continues and then finally after uh, Jackson knocked the hitman's gun that she had, suddenly um, her father Joe actually picked up the gun and shot him right in the chest. So then everything was finally safe and sound. So then already with uh, Lisa getting medical attention, she finally arrived at the hotel to see if everybody's okay. And yep, Keith and the Secret Service thanked Lisa and Cynthia for saving him and his family from the assassination. 
where that's when we meet Bob and Marion Taylor, you know, both played by Robert Pine and, and Teresa Press Marks. This is a scene where Bob and Marianne Taylor, the two visitors at the hotel, confronts Lisa and Sophia by angrily complaining about their stay, which then Lisa tells them to fill out a comic card at the front desk and shove it up their ass. <laughs> yeah, so then the movie ends. And yeah, I, I really did enjoy this movie, and surprisingly enough, uh, this was Wes Craven's... Uh, last good film that he ever did because after this movie he went on to do films like My Soul to Take which was a horrible film yeah but I know he tried so hard to make a horror movie this good given the fact that this was the first film that he ever did that was given its 3D treatment yeah that didn't work out and then of course he went on to do his last movie surprisingly enough which turned out to be a sequel to the Scream movies, yep, Scream 4, which, yep, turned out to be one of its weakest. And that's what happened to him after that. And he was already working on some new plans to make another movie, you know, before his death, sadly, I know. Anyway, um, I really did enjoy this movie. Surprisingly, it was a box office success. You know, it actually receives positive reviews from critics and fans of Wes Craven out there. So they really did enjoy it. It had an awesome score by Marco Beltrami. You know, because I, I love the music that they chose for the film, you know. It had a lot of great beats that makes it more suspenseful than ever before. Sort of like a Hitchcockian type of um, score that they had to use for the movie. And it works, and I like that. Not to mention this was a fast-paced uh, suspense thriller, which, um, yep, it only made it up to 85 minutes. Yep. With its budget of $26 million, made it up to uh, 95 $577,774 million at the box office. So it, it worked so well. Um, I like the cast too. I thought Rachel McAdams did a great job, you know, playing the role that that she actually got to do something. You know, she's actually uh, very strong. You know, that she can actually uh, stop uh, Jackson at any time and and try to save everybody from being assassinated by the terrorists. Yeah, she did everything to stop him. Now she had a friend, of course, who was a co-worker named Cynthia, so it was cool. You know, Jama Mays in her earlier role, you know, before she went on to do other stuff. Yeah, she's very quirky, too, at times. You know, especially with that wide eyes that she has, you know. And she's a redhead, of course. But, yeah. Uh, Killian Murphy, of course, as young and handsome as he is, and, yeah, with that luscious uh, blue eyes... You know, and given once again an American accent a after playing uh, that scarecrow role in, in Batman Begins. And he's just as chilling as ever. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, at first, you know, you wanted to love him. But then suddenly he turns out to be a creep. And, th and this is exactly his plan all along. You know, it's like he starts across as being suave, but then he's just... Oh God, it's like you're just going to be afraid to actually uh, to meet this uh, guy who's actually hired to uh, to steal uh, Lisa's father's uh, wallet and tries to um, hire a, a hitman to actually kill him. And, and you know the whole thing was going to happen as, just as long as it's part of um, his plan to, to keep Lisa cooperate from this job. So that way both of them can be safe. So yeah, and the fact that this movie was released just a few years after the 9-11 that's been going on, yeah, and I know 9-11 was on Friday, I guess this was the perfect time to finally make a movie that's fast-paced and it was, you know, well-made as it turned out. It does have some comedy elements that they went into with some of those scenes, you know, especially with, uh, you know, Robert Pine. And Teresa plus Marx, you know, as the couple who was staying over at the hotel, which I know you saw them earlier in the film when he was talking to the to Lisa about attending at the 
the hotel and everything. Yeah, they're always complaining about yeah. And it was also cool to see uh, Brian Cox actually playing uh, her father. Yeah, even though it was sort of cheesy, have having to have him, you know, just worrying a lot and trying to call him to see if everybody's okay. But he is, of course, a, a good father. Yeah, because he knew exactly how he felt. Because he didn't want to lose um, her daughter into whenever there's some danger that's going around. Um, but I just like the fact that the, at the end he finally gets uh, help her out after uh, the last final battle. And sad to say, this movie hasn't gotten a Blu-ray release um, as of now. And I hope it does because, you know, this movie does have some extras on the DVD. Yep. Yep. That has the outtakes and bloopers, you know, the uh, the making of the thriller, and it even focuses on um, Wes Craven's work on how to make a, a suspense thriller like Red Eye after making all these horror movies. So in that sort of way, yeah, it was released by DreamWorks Pictures, and and this movie uh, came out just a couple months after uh, his other film. That was, of course, PG-13 as well, called Curse with uh, Christina Ricci and and Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah, I didn't think it wasn't that great, um, in my opinion. I mean, it had its moments, but it, it was actually one of his weakest for a horror movie. But it was it was actually great that he got to do a suspense thriller that's far different than any of the horror films he's been doing, considering that he's one of my favorite. Uh, horror directors yeah but uh, yeah I mean and this movie works I, I really enjoyed the suspense that they went into and it had the energy that they went into it also has a lot of action scenes you know such as uh, having Lisa drive an SUV you know actually running over the hitman into her house I mean that was really something yeah everything that went into it and yeah, it's just amazing that uh, Craven had done a very good job doing this film. And it's just sad that, you know, we could have seen another suspense thriller that's in the tradition of Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, if, if he was still alive today. Yeah, I just hope that someday this movie does get a Blu-ray release, because it really deserves this. It's been on DVD for a very long time, and, and I think it, it really needs to be. So... So that's uh, Red Eye, and I give that film five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.